My name is Rachel Rofe. I created this show because I wanted to help you see that if you have a choice, you can choose a better life. If you're listening to this podcast, you're in a pretty fortunate position. You have free will, ability to connect to the internet, and access to all kinds of new education. This podcast is meant to help you make the most of your good fortune. We talk with all kinds of people here from all walks of life because I want you to see that no matter what your situation, there's always a way to create a life that you're proud of. Hello, everyone. Today we're here with Hal Elrod. Hal died at age 20. He was hit head-on by a drunk driver at 70 miles per hour, was dead for six minutes, broke 11 bones, and was told that he'd never walk again. Well, not only did he walk, he bounced back to run a 52-mile ultramarathon, became a Hall of Fame business achiever, international keynote speaker, and multiple-time number one best-selling author, including his new book, The Miracle Morning, which is literally being widely regarded as one of the most life-changing books ever written and has an impressive 350-plus five-star reviews on Amazon. He's also the host of the Achieve Your Goals podcast. I actually found out about Hal through an interview. Actually, an entrepreneur on fire, John Lee Dumas, was talking to another guest, and he mentioned how Hal's interview was one of the most inspiring ones that he'd ever done. So I went back to listen to that interview and thought it was amazing. Then I downloaded the book, The Miracle Morning, which I've talked about on many podcasts now, so you guys are familiar with it. And I just sent a tweet to Hal saying how awesome I thought he was. And it ended up being that we were talking. And so now I'm just talking to this guy with with all of you guys here on this podcast that I'm just super excited by because Miracle Morning and Slight Edge, I would say for sure, my two favorite books. I tell everyone to read them. They're amazing. And this book's just so, so good. I'm so excited about it. I'm so excited you're here, Hal. Thank you. I'm equally excited. Like, I, I love your energy. I love your spirit. I love your intention. And everything you just said was so nice. So the, thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. So, as you know, the intention behind A Better Life is to show people that if they have a choice, they can choose a better life. So can you take a minute to share with us some of the things that you're most proud of in your life? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, honestly, now what I'm most proud of are my kids when I see something, when I see them living or exemplifying something that I've tried to instill in them. I think that that really gets me proud. Like when my, my daughter comes and she goes, Dad, I'm so grateful for this house that you, that you work so hard so we can have this nice house. Thank you so much. Or she tells my wife, Mom, Thank, I'm so grateful that you made us this dinner. Thank you so much. And like, I just get, you know, I just get so proud. And, oh. Um, special moment. So that's probably the, the proudest moments of my life now. And, and looking back personally, after my car accident, which I know you mentioned in the introduction, I got out of the hospital and uh, I was, you know, I could barely walk. I mean, I had really significant brain damage. I had almost no short-term memory. And I had every excuse to, you know, to kind of take it easy and, 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 and not do much. Well, when I got out of the hospital... The company that I worked for was having a sales competition, which I usually showed up for. Like that was my thing. That was when I really shined. Is when uh, I would go out and try to break records and, and be the top salesperson. And I was talking to a friend who, who one of my colleagues, and uh, I had just gotten out of the hospital. And I, I said, "Hey," he said, "I got to get off the phone, Hal. I'd love to keep talking, but we're in the middle of a, a push period. You know, I got to go out and get on the phone and schedule appointments." And I made a joke and I said. Dude, how funny would that be? What, what if I went out and sold during the push period and like, you know, won a trophy or something, one of the top guys? And he laughed. He goes, yeah, I think you got more important things that you need to worry about, you know, learning to walk in and all of that. And I got off the phone with him and I just had this sense of like, I thought, what if I really did that? Like, <laughs> I have every excuse to not do that. What if I found a way? Like, I couldn't drive. My brain damage was so bad. My driver's license was revoked. I, you know, a lot of pain. I thought, what if I did it? And I begged my mom and dad. They said no for like a week. And with four days left in this two-week sales contest, my dad finally gave in. I begged him, and he started driving me to my sales appointments. And in these last four days, I was competing with like 500 other sales reps, which were, again, they were working for two weeks. I only had four days. And in four days, I sold more then 496 of the 500 sales reps did in the two-week period. Ironically, my best friend that was on the phone with me that initiated this, he did beat me. But uh, but yeah, that was really the proudest moment of my life because I showed up to this conference that they had dedicated to me since you know what I, everything I had been through. Then I actually walked up on stage and you know was and won the fourth place trophy out of out of about 500 sales reps. So 
that was my proudest moment in my life. It was, I mean, I was crying. My mom and dad were in the audience. They were crying. Like probably half the people in the audience in the room were crying. But since I've had kids, uh, that's you know that's on the back burner. That was a long time ago, and now I'm more focused on the impact that I make in their lives. Wow, that's an incredible story. I didn't know that. I share that very often, so that was a cool opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you for doing so. I mean, because I know listening to your book, it could have been so many different things. Like you talked about how you were in a runner and then you ended up doing this 52 mile marathon and <laughs> and just the going back and getting in the Hall of Fame, just so many great things. So that's cool. You're so inspiring. And one of the things that I think would be awesome for you to tell people about that I heard on your Entrepreneur on Fire interview, which I think just speaks to so many people, is about that the hardest period in your life, even though you were pronounced dead and all that, was actually something that happened after that. Can you tell people about that? Yeah. In the Miracle Morning, right, I talk about the two rock bottoms that I've experienced in my life. And we've all experienced rock bottom, right? And it's, it's different for everybody, but it's that time, those time or times in your life where you thought it couldn't get any worse. It, it was the worst it had ever been for you. And, you know, I always think back to like when I was in seventh grade and I got my heart broken by a girl, like, that was my rock bottom back then. Like life had not been any worse. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to leave my bed. I was just depressed and crying and you know what I mean? And, and so rock bottom is different for everybody. And, and I think we go through those times more than once in our life typically. And my first rock bottom, the major one was that car accident. And most people kind of like you said, they, they go, you know, how does it get worse than dying? Like what, how do you, I don't get how the second one could be worse than the first. But what happened, and I think a lot of people can relate to the second one much more than the first one. The second one was in 2007 through 9, kind of in that period, when the U.S. economy began to crash. I went from being relatively successful. I had, I had a successful business. I, had, I was a success coach, actually, and a, a motivational speaker, keynote speaker, author. And almost it felt like it was overnight. My business failed. And I lost half my clients because the economy affected them. They couldn't pay me. It was kind of the trickle-down effect. And almost overnight, I lost over half my income, couldn't pay my bills, couldn't pay my mortgage, lost my house back to the bank, completely stopped exercising because I had been, you know, I was in scarcity mode. It's like, I don't have time to exercise, plus I can't afford my gym membership, right? So I just woke up, worked all day, watched an hour of TV, went to bed, woke up, worked all day. It was like my, my, my routine, but I wasn't really progressing. It was actually kept going backwards. And the reason I saved was so much more difficult than my car accident I really believe it's because when I woke up from my coma, I faced the news. You know, it was, it was pretty scary at first, but then I realized, wow, it can't get any worse than this. Like, I'm, I'm going to go up from here. I'm going to heal. Time is going to heal. I'm going to get better. Things can only get better. Well, when the economy crashed, I, every day it felt like I was at my lowest point, and I was so scared. But then another client canceled, and another creditor called. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm looking in the mirror and I'm in the worst shape of my life. You know, every day that goes by, I'm getting, I'm putting on weight. I mean, it was just, it just kept getting worse. And I think that's why it was the most, you know, such a difficult time in my life. Mm. And so how did you end up getting out of that? You know, it was basically a six month downward spiral and I didn't tell anyone about it other than my fiance, who is now my wife. So yes, she stuck around, but I didn't tell anyone about it because I was, Rachel, if you could imagine, as a success coach, it was really an identity crisis for me to be failing physically, mentally, financially, emotionally, in every way to be such a mess, you know, and it was like, I'm a success coach, so I didn't tell anyone because I thought, well, a success coach, what do I do? I reach out to people and go, hey, um, I'm failing miserably, so I really need more clients. Do you know anyone that needs a, you know, success coach that's that's stressed, you know, that's a mess? (sighs) So finally, one thing led to another, a conversation with my fiance, my wife now, led to a conversation with my best friend, and he said, Hal, are you exercising every day? I can barely get out of bed in the morning, man. I'm not exercising at all. He said, Hal, you're a smart guy, but if you're not getting blood and oxygen to your brain, if you're not putting yourself in a peak physical, mental, and emotional state each day, you're going to stay stuck. You've got to get yourself in a peak state, and then you'll, you'll, you'll think clearer. You'll have ideas. You'll make better decisions. You'll have more energy. You'll feel more motivated. And I hated running at that time, but I thought, you know what, he's right. I went for a run, and on the run, I heard a quote from Jim Rohn, and this quote changed my life. And this is the quote that the Miracle Morning literally was, would not occur, it would not exist as it does today if it wasn't for this quote from Jim Rohn. And here's the quote. Your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development because success is something you attract by the person that you become. And in that moment, I realized 
I'm not dedicating time every day to my personal development. I just, I hit the snooze button a couple times, go into my office, lock myself in there, work all day, grind, you know, and then, like I said, watch TV, go to bed. I'm not dedicating any time to personal development, and therefore, I'm not becoming the person that I need to be that can attract or create the success that I really want in my life. And in that moment, I had this epiphany. I've got to dedicate a significant block of time. And it wasn't like it was rocket science. I mean, Tony Robbins talks about his hour of power. But again, I wasn't doing it. And I think you look at most people in America, they're not doing it. Most people in America do not have a success ritual, a personal development ritual in place. Most successful people do, but most people don't. And so I ran home, and my challenge was, when am I going to do this personal development routine? You know, I, I was already so I thought I was so busy. I'm not a morning person, but if I want my life to change. So the next morning, I woke up at 5 a.m. I did this routine that's now known as Miracle Morning. I, I, I made it up the night before after about an hour of research of kind of the best, most effective personal development practices. And that morning, my entire life changed because I woke up at 5 a.m., which, which felt crazy to me, but I actually, it was actually easy because I was excited. By 6 a.m., Rachel, I never in my life had felt so empowered and so inspired and so energized and motivated and, and at peace with my challenges with, with the optimism that I could change things. And within two months of doing my morning routine, it, it was, wasn't called the Miracle Morning. It didn't, have a, it didn't have a name. But within two months, the results were profound. I more than doubled my income. I went from $5,000 a month to $12,000 a month in two months as a direct result of what I did during that morning routine. I, physically, I went from being in the worst shape of my life, having never run more than the mile in PE class that was required. I never ran a day in my life outside of PE class, and I trained for a 52-mile ultramarathon. It began the next morning. The second miracle morning is when that began. And I went from being deeply depressed, and my depression didn't take two months to go away. It was literally gone, or I should say it was it went from a level nine to like a level two within 24 hours. It was incredible. And I started calling it my miracle morning. And I never knew it would be a book. I never thought I would teach it to other people. And, uh, you know, I never, never thought it'd become what it has today. So can you explain some of the things that are included in the miracle morning? Absolutely. And, and the funny part, I laugh when I say that because I, when I, what happened, I came back from my run, right? And I'm researching what do successful people do every day? And that's actually where... The first thing that kept coming up, I was reading articles on like, you know, entrepreneur.com and Fast Company and Huffington Post and, you know, on and on and, and, and successful like bloggers, you know, really successful bloggers. And waking up early was the, the, the one thing I just kept seeing. It. They have, you know, I kept seeing early rising and I'm like, I just finally couldn't deny it. And then as I kept doing research, I, I ended up making a list of six practices by Googling what do successful people do every day. And at first, I was really disappointed. That's why I laughed, because I almost dismissed the whole thing, because the six practices, and I'll, I'll tell you what those are in just a second, but I had heard of all of them. And, you know, it's like our society, we're conditioned, we're looking for the, the magic bullet. We're looking for, right? We're looking for the, the magic pill. We're looking for the app on our phone that can make it just so easy to get what we want, right? That's, we're looking for the easy way, and we're looking for the new way, something we've never heard of. And so for me, I get these six practices, and they're age-old practices, right? And I thought, man, these aren't exciting. These aren't new. I've heard of all of these. Then it hit me. I don't do any of these. But successful people, Oprah swears by them. Jerry Seinfeld swears by them. Will Smith swears by them. You know, I mean, all these successful people swear by these practices, and I don't do them. So then it hit me. I've got to do them. And at first I was going to do one or two, and then I thought, what if I did all six of them for 10 minutes each in the morning? You know, that would be like personal development you know, on steroids or turbocharged or, or however you want to look at it. And so the six practices, to keep it memorable, I organized them into an acronym. So anybody taking notes, grab your pen. These are what I call the life savers. And the word savers is the acronym. The first S is for silence. So instead of starting your day rushed and chaotic trying to get out the door, it's about starting your day with a period of purposeful silence. So that could be meditation. That could be prayer. To be a combination of both. I do a little bit of both, right? Some deep breathing. It's a way to lower your stress, really get calm, really get centered, etc. The uh, the A is for affirmation. And I really believe that affirmations are the most effective way to program or reprogram your subconscious mind 
with the beliefs, with the mindset, the confidence that you need to achieve anything that you want in your life. You can overcome any fear, overcome any limiting belief, overcome any insecurity through simply consistently repeating affirmations every day and your subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between what's real and what's vividly imagined each day. That's why when you wake up from a nightmare, you're literally physically sweating. Even though it wasn't real, your subconscious mind only knows what it imagined. So affirmations make that possible. B is for visualization. And let me give a quick, Rachel, can I give a quick tip on this? Absolutely. Okay, so I think visualization is really taught ineffectively, the way that it's taught by most experts or gurus, right? They teach, and I'm not trying to bash anybody, but they, they, I think they only teach half of the equation. And what I mean by that is they teach you to visualize the big picture, the long-term end result, right? And, 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 and that's good, but that's only half the equation. The reason that you want to do that, and the reason it's good, is because it takes these goals or dreams or ideas that we have floating around in our head, which usually are cloaked in insecurity and fear. Think about that, right? We've got a goal or a dream, but it's got like this fear bubble that's like around it. And we typically never break through that fear bubble to really take significant action toward our grandest vision for our life, right? Our biggest goals, our biggest dreams. So when you do visualize the, and you see that goal you see that dream, you see what it's going to look like, and then you create the feelings of what it's going to feel like when it becomes a reality, it, it, it kind of removes that fear bubble, or, or at least thins it out, so that you now take it from this idea bouncing around in your head to a clear vision of what's possible. And it tends to increase your desire, your motivation, and your belief that it can be real. So that's the first half. But most experts, that's all they teach you. You make a vision board. And that's great, but it doesn't necessarily get you into action. In fact, research has shown that visualizing something in that way, the end result, can actually trick your subconscious mind into thinking it's as good as done and removing the, the, the sense of urgency to take action and make it happen. If you see it so many times, you're like, man, that's, like, that's, that's going to be my future. I believe it now. And then you can go back to doing whatever you're doing that's not necessarily in alignment with that vision. So the second part of visualization that's crucial is that you take your visualization from the, the, the big picture long term and you bring it into the present moment. You bring it into today and you visualize yourself taking the necessary actions today, the actions that you must take today to ensure that you take the right steps toward the long term vision, that you move in that direction. And so the idea is that you see yourself doing it with a smile on your face, with confidence, with purpose, with right, with focus. So for me, when I was writing The Miracle Morning, what did I do? Well, first I visualized the long-term result. I would actually see the book cover. I, I, I had the book cover designed like a year or two before the book was written. But I would see somebody reading it with like a look on their face of, wow, like this is amazing. It's changing my life. So I would see that. Then I would see them showing it to somebody else and telling someone else about it. You've got to read this book. So that was my long-term vision that would really increase my desire to make that vision a reality. But I immediately switched my visualization to see myself at my computer typing as if I were looking at myself from outside of my own body. I would see myself typing the Miracle Morning on a Microsoft Word document. And I would see myself typing quickly and with my eyes lighting up because of all of the ideas that I was generating. I would see myself overcoming writer's block, feeling confident, putting the right words on the page that the reader would eventually need to hear. And that, it was such a compelling vision, not the long-term one, but the, the short-term one especially, that I literally would want to open my eyes, open my computer, and get to work. And that's the key to making visualization truly action-oriented so that you get results from it. So if you have any thoughts or questions on that, and then I can go through the rest of the savers. I just think that's such a great point that you're saying about, first of all, the vision boards, about how it can actually make people not take action. And then also just the visualization and the short term, because I know that you mentioned in the book that you hadn't seen yourself as a writer. So to be able to do that visualization where you're imagining loving it so much to creating the book that you did, I just really want to highlight that point because that's such a great tip. Thank you. I appreciate that. And let me just, just to translate it for anybody that's not writing a book, Let's say it's getting in shape, right? Half your visualization, see yourself with the body, with the, you know, the six-pack or the eight-pack or 
the, the whatever it is, the, the wearing the size six jeans or whatever it is, the first part of your visualization, you see yourself as you want to become so that you get inspired and you see that vision, you want to move toward it. And then you want to take your visualization to see yourself doing the exercise, the activity, the gym time, the run, whatever it is. See yourself in your gym clothes doing the run and then with a smile on your face, sweating, enjoying it, feel what that's going to feel like. So much so that you're compelled to open your eyes and grab your gym bag and get to the gym. If you're making sales calls, see yourself on the phone with a smile on your face, see responding according to how you want them to respond, etc., etc. So the E in savers is for exercise. And I'll just make a quick point on this. I've had people say, well, how couldn't I do the savers any time in the day? Could in the afternoon or the evening after you know work or whatever. However, there are extraordinary benefits to each of these practices, specifically to the morning. For example, meditation in the morning, it lowers your stress, allows you to get focused, to get clear, and you don't want to go without that benefit for the entire day. Exercise is an even better example. When you exercise, you increase the oxygen and blood flow to your brain, you increase your energy, your mental clarity, you release endorphins that make you feel good. Why would you want to lose out on those benefits throughout the entire day, have a day that's missing that, and then wait till the afternoon or the evening? Now, by the way, I only exercise for 10 minutes in the morning, and I still go to the gym for today. My wife dragged me for the first time to her one hour. I don't know what it's called, body pump class or whatever, Rachel. <laughs> my wife, I didn't realize she's in such better shape. I was getting my butt kicked in that class, and she's just cranking along. I'm like, wow, you're amazing. So anyway, <laughs> so, so that feels exercise. Um, the R is for reading, and I'm not talking about Fifty Shades of Grey or Harry Potter. You know, those books are fine, but, uh, but read self-help, right? Read books that will allow you to become the person that you need to be with the, the mindset and the knowledge and the skill set to create any results that you want for your life. Let me give you an example. I am currently planning my first ever live event, which is like years overdue. I could have, should have, would have ran this years ago, but fear prevented me from doing it and not making it a priority, yada, yada, yada. So it's finally a priority. So what book am I reading right now? Well, it's on how to you know create and market and promote your own seminars, right? That's what the book's on. So make sure you read books that are in alignment with your current top priority. Whatever goal is the number one goal in your life for this year or right now, make sure the books you're reading are helping you to develop yourself into the person that can easily achieve that goal. And then, and by the way, if you think you don't have time for reading, here's the deal. Let's say you read during your miracle morning. Most people go, well, 10 minutes a day, that's not that much. It's not, you know, I'm not going to make that much progress. Let's say you read average speed, about a page a minute. 10 minutes a day, that's 10 pages per day. If you quantify that over the year, that's 3,650 pages a year. That's the equivalent of 18 200-page self-help books. If you or I read 18 200-page self-help books a year, we're going to put ourselves in like the top 1% of society in terms of the knowledge that we have to be successful, to be happy, to be fulfilled, to be a better father, husband, mother, sister, you know, lawyer, whatever, whatever it is, whatever roles we play, there's books out there that can accelerate our success. And then the final S is for scribing. And I, I got to give credit to the thesaurus on this one, Rachel. My vocabulary is not that big. Um, <laughs> but, but basically, this is what, I, what originally was journaling, but the J just didn't fit into the SAVERS acronym. So scribing is a fancy word for writing. And so that could be journaling, right, which is typically... Uh, that's my favorite form of scribing. And journaling is proven to be one of the most effective ways to really get clarity, solidify your commitments, to gain clarity on what you have to be grateful for, what you need to do to make today the, you know, whatever you journal essentially, there's magic that happens when you put pen to paper. My favorite, if I can uh, plug my favorite journaling app, it's called Five Minute Journal. Rachel, have you, have you found that one yet? I've heard of it. I haven't used it. So great. It's an app on the iPhone which I use and then they also make a like hardcover journal, but I, I won't go into detail, but just check it out. Read the reviews. It, it's phenomenal. It's my favorite. <laughs> it's funny. I even have a Miracle Morning journal that a lot of people like. You know, it's for sale on Amazon. I don't recommend that anymore. I used to recommend that. Now I recommend the five-minute journal. So that should show you, show you how wow. big a fan I am. <laughs> the Miracle Morning journal is cool, too. You can check that out. But So those are the lifesavers. And I, I will say this, that each of them provides such experience 
extraordinary benefits. I mean, really like game-changing benefits for us. If you do your own research, you can find every single one of those. There are some of the most successful people in the world that swear by any one of them individually. And that's what made the Miracle Morning so powerful. You know, I could have done one of those. I could have meditated every morning. And you'll see people that say, meditation changed my life. In fact, if you're a results-oriented person and you're like, yeah, meditation, ah, I've tried it or I don't have time for it or it seems too, like, mystical or whatever, Google Fortune 500 CEOs that meditate. I did this for my friend a few weeks ago. He goes, Hal, I don't, I'm not a meditator, dude. I, I, I'm about results. And I grabbed his phone out of his hand and I, I Googled Fortune 500 CEOs that meditate and I, I handed it back to him. There's all these articles. I mean, there's like dozens and dozens of articles on that specific topic. And he goes, there's nothing you could have said to me that would have been more convincing than the fact of me looking at this search, knowing that all these Fortune 500 CEOs swear by meditation because, you know, he goes, I know how results oriented they have to be. So... The point is, all six of these practices by themselves are game changers. So when you put all six together, and it's scalable, you could, you know, in the Miracle Morning book, I, I do. There's a whole chapter on customizing your Miracle Morning, and you could do, do a six-minute Miracle Morning, you could do a 60-minute Miracle Morning, you could do a 30-minute, two-hour, totally scalable to your schedule, and you can adjust the length of each one. You might want to do only five minutes of meditation, but you might want to do 20 minutes of reading, et cetera, et cetera. So. This is totally scalable and customizable according to each person's you know, preferences or availability or, or whatever it is regarding your schedule. So what about people listening to audiobooks while they're exercising? That's fantastic. I'm, yeah, I'm glad you said that because I'm a big fan of combining. So when I'm doing my stretching in the morning, I'm, you know, I'm either listening to an audio or I'm reading my Kindle book or I'm reading my affirmations. So yeah, I, I do combine them as well. I was curious. So I know that I was reading the reviews on the book and a lot of people that were saying like once they actually did this, then everything, they felt really good. They were excited to get out of bed. I'm curious, like what are the biggest objections people give you about the Miracle Morning and how do you respond to them? Like why, what are the biggest reasons why people don't do it? Rachel, you're such a good interviewer. That's such a good question. I mean, I think the biggest objection is I'm not a morning person. And in the book, I think that that was one of the things that I prob that probably made the biggest difference in the book is I think I really busted that like that myth or whatever like that you either are or aren't a morning person and then I made it really easy for people that did not ever consider themselves morning people which was me my entire life never a morning person um, and then I got up at 5 a.m. that morning and I've never looked back I literally have gotten up at 5 a.m. or earlier every single day for the last whatever six years. Uh, five years, uh, unless unless I'm up late. I mean, if I'm up at if I'm up till midnight for New Year's Eve, I don't get up at you know 4 a.m. or whatever. But um, but uh, any any day that I can get up that I you know that I'm on on a normal schedule, I get up at 3:30 in the morning. Now it's 3:30 in the morning, so I'm a little bit crazier than most people. But anyway, to answer your question directly, um, the uh, so the biggest the biggest concern or objection I think is I'm not a morning person. But I would say probably, and I'm, I'm kind of kind of a guess. Um, but I'd say roughly 60 to 70 percent of the people that do the Miracle Morning every day, that swear by it, that have said it's totally changed their life, did not consider themselves morning people before they started. You know, you mentioned the Amazon reviews. If you go read the Amazon reviews, a lot of people say, I kept getting this book recommended to me, but I wasn't a morning person, so I resisted it. And then they finally read it. I think probably the most important chapter in the book, it, it's, it's funny, I didn't imagine this. In fact, this chapter barely even made it. It was actually a blog post that I decided to put in there. And it's now become the most important chapter. And it's like four pages or something. But it's called the five-step snooze-proof wake-up strategy. And then it's in parentheses, it says for the snooze-aholics, right? And, and the point is, I was actually just speaking at EO, an organization that has, you know, 9,000 CEOs as part of it. And I was speaking to 70 CEOs in New York. And the CEO that introduced me, and he actually is the one that brought me in to speak, David Sherman, now become a friend of mine, and he said, you guys, he said, this book has changed my life more than any other book I've ever read. And he said, I was not a morning person before I read it, but there's this chapter in here called the five steps to the wake up strategy. The, the five steps are so simple, like a fifth grader could do them. They're so easy. But he goes, they're total game changers. Number one, I put the alarm clock across the room. Well, that was a game changer because I used to just turn it off Without even being fully awake, every night when it, every morning went off on my nightstand, I would just reach over, you know, keep my eyes closed and just turn it off. And he goes, having to get out of bed, simple as it sounds, total game changer. It's allowed me to actually get up. So I think that's the biggest concern. And I think that if it wasn't for that little chapter, 
I think this book would have, it, have completely been a failure. Because I think people would have, you know, read the beginning and been like, wow, I never realized how important early rising was and how much it could change every area of my life, literally simultaneously. Like, you can improve your relationships, your health, your finances, like I did, simultaneously. So they would have been like, okay, I get it now, I'm sold, I'm ready to be an early riser. And then they would have learned the lifesavers and been like, wow, now I've got this routine, I know what to do. But without that little tiny chapter in the middle, they probably would have failed. They would have been like, yeah, you know, the Miracle Morning was, it was cool. I, I was like, I was so amped up, but I just, you know, I hit the snooze button again. I, I just could not get myself out of bed. I think that's literally the biggest thing the Miracle Morning has done is it's it just simply like transform people from never being a morning person to now they can. And, and then the other people that were morning people, the 30 to 40% that, you know, they were already highly successful, highly motivated early risers. You know, they've said that what they what it did for them is it gave them the structure to make their mornings extraordinary, where in the past they'd wake up early, but then they would just go right to email or right to Facebook or, you know, maybe they'd exercise, that's all they did. And now they've got the whole lifesaver routine, and now it's really taken their morning to a level that they've never had it at before. Mm. I loved what you said about how every morning you're being given a gift and that when your alarm clocks and you go and you hit the snooze button, that it's basically like saying, I don't want this gift. Yeah, when the alarm clock goes off in the morning, it's, it's life's first gift to you, you know, I think. And, and it, but it's also life's first challenge, right? Life, you could say life's first test. It's kind of the challenge or the test is, hey, you claim to want an extraordinary life. So here you go. Here's the day, right? Alarm's going off. Here's the day. You can do whatever you want with it. And we claim to want an extraordinary life, but the message we send to the universe is, well, no, 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 not as bad as I want to lay here unconscious for another nine or ten minutes, right? <laughs> and the alarm goes off again. It's like, uh, yeah, I could wake up and become a better version of myself, but I'm too lazy. I just want to lay. I don't have the discipline. And think about that. If you start your day with procrastination by hitting the snooze button, you start your day with a lack of self-discipline to get yourself out of bed, think about what that does to your subconscious and your self-concept. You're literally telling yourself, I don't even have the discipline to get out of bed in the morning. But when you wake up in the morning and that alarm clock goes off and you go, I'm committed to becoming the person that I need to be to create the most extraordinary life you can imagine. And I'm going to prove it because I'm getting out of bed right now. I'm not going to snooze. I'm not going to waste the first you know, 30 to 60 minutes of my day. I think that's such a good point. That has gotten me up out of bed so many times when I've wanted to just kind of lay there. <laughs> so what about people who tell you that if they wake up early, they're not going to get sleep and they need enough sleep to be able to be optimal throughout the day? So two things. Uh, who was I just talking to about this? Talking to somebody, it was like in the last 24 hours, and I'm blanking, they had said that you know they do the Miracle Morning now, and before the Miracle Morning, they would stay up late, but they realized they didn't really do anything productively. They were just watching TV typically. And I love what, you know, Tony Robbins was, he was interviewing Eben Pagan. And if you don't know Eben Pagan, he's the founder of Wake Up Productive. He's, he's basically he's a self-made multi, multi-millionaire. He works from home and I think his company does about $25 million a year. And it's just him and some virtual employees. But at the end of the interview, he, and he gave the most, I mean, it's an amazing interview, so much value. And Tony said, Eben, you've given us so much value today. If you could break it down and just give people, leave them with one tip, one thing they can immediately begin take their business and, and their lives to the next level and, and implement everything that you've been talking about, what would, what would the one, one thing be if you could narrow it down? And he said, create a morning success ritual. He said, the most important thing you can do, and of course I'm listening to this smiling like ear to ear like, yes, awesome, this is, you know, this, is, this is what I would say too. But he said, create a morning success ritual because how you spend the first hour of your day, he said, you should spend the first hour of your day making yourself stronger, mentally, physically, emotionally stronger. And, and what happens is how you spend the first hour of your day, he said it sets the mindset or your mindset and the context for the rest of your day. So if you have a focused, growth-oriented, goal-oriented, productive morning, first, right, that's who you're going to be for the rest of the day. And if you do that every day, extraordinary success literally becomes inevitable. I mean, you, you can't wake up every day and become that version, that better version of yourself and not see amazing results in your life. Awesome. In your experience, what is something that some people don't share about improving yourself, or actually most people don't share about improving yourself? Either it's not sexy or it just doesn't have that rainbows and butterflies, like, you know, visualize your life being great and it shall be kind of thing. Yeah, I think that it's just hard work, you know, that's not talked about as much. I, you see people now that are transparent, that do, they're, they're real, you know, like 
you know, Gary Vaynerchuk or whoever, that they're, they're, they're real, they're, they're authentic. They're like, dude, you got to work, you got to grind, right? Mark Cuban said for, I think it was for six years, he had no social life and he just worked 80 hours a week, right? And do you think he regrets it now? Right? Probably not. But, but I think that's it. It's the, it's, it's the hard work. It's the grind. Right now, what's happened with the Miracle Morning, it's taken my career to a whole new level. I just got interviewed on the Dave Ramsey podcast last week, and a few days ago, Darren Hardy interviewed me for the Success Magazine audio series. Like, just a whole new level. I, I'm a, kind of uh, experiencing a, a new level of success and, and impact and reaching more people. And, and now I'm on Rachel's podcast, right? You know what I mean? A Better Life podcast. It just keeps getting better. <laughs> better. But the point is, my wife said this the other day when I told her, I was actually when I told her, I go, sweetie, I just had a dream come true. She's like, what? I said, Darren Hardy's emailed me. He wants to interview me for hit the Success Magazine audio series. Like, I'm so excited. And she didn't even know who that was. And I had to explain to her who he was and, like, <laughs> show her. She's like, wow, it's amazing. And she goes, sweetie, it's so great to see you've been working so hard for the last 10 years, <laughs> basically. And she goes, it's so great to see, like, it, you know, not that it hasn't paid off in the last 10 years. I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've, I've no complaints. I've had a great life and, and been able to impact people along the way. But it's now, like I said, now it's just going to this whole new level. And it's so great to see. I don't remember who said this. I've heard a few people say Josh Schiff, you know, founder of YouthSpeakerUniversity.com. He was one that said, it, you know, it took him 10 years to become an overnight success. And I've heard multiple say that. And, you know, it's, I'm looking right, you know, it's right now it's about 10 years when I became a total entrepreneur and left my sales position and, you know, ventured out into the scary world of being completely self-employed with no guaranteed paycheck, right? really is it's so true that it takes 10 years to be an overnight success and that's the thing is most people they're not willing to go through the ups and the downs and the struggle and the you know overcome the challenges and the hurdles for 10 years to experience that extraordinary success that everybody wants so i think that's the the, the thing that you know that most people it, it's hard to sell hey buy my program and in 10 years you can be highly successful <laughs> And so what do you do like when you're tired and you're just overworking, but you still have things to do? How do you get through that? I drink about two cups of coffee a day and I do it very systematically. I literally space it out where my first cup of coffee, I pour it 345 in the morning and I finish it right before I take lunch at 11 a.m. So if you can imagine, I literally sip a cup of coffee for seven hours. <laughs> it's cold within an hour. So six hours I'm drinking cold coffee and I literally just sip it because I like the taste, and I guess I like the, the you know, the kind of slow drip feeding of pot of caffeine, right? <laughs> Very minimal. And then after lunch, I pour my second cup of coffee, and I sip that for basically four hours. So it's a shortened window. I drink it a little faster, but I drink that from 1, 1 to 5 p.m. So there is a little bit of caffeine in it, right? So, but not a lot. And be, I think because I don't drink a lot of coffee fast, I don't need 12 cups because I'm not peaking and then crashing, right? Also, I, you know, I believe in movement. So, meaning, you know, I know the more you exercise, the more you generate energy for your body, you increase your energy capacity. So, for example, think of somebody that can run, you know, if they can run 10 miles, if they've gotten themselves in that kind of shape, then maintaining the energy to just function through a normal day is relatively easy. So, the more you exercise, the more you expand your energy capacity. So, I start every day in the morning, do a little bit of exercise, some yoga, etc. And then every day at lunch, I take a break and I go and I play basketball for like 30 minutes every day at lunch. So, or I go to the gym. So I, I exercise in the middle of the day. It's like recharging your batteries to give you that energy to, to finish out the day strong. And then I am not against taking a nap. If I listen to my body. If I really feel fatigued for whatever reason, I will take a 20 minute power nap. And a little ninja tip that I've read on like entrepreneur.com, I don't know where I've read it, but drink a little bit of coffee before you hit your power nap because it takes about 20 to 30 minutes for that caffeine to kick in. So it's kind of a little, you know, a little like, it's like hacking your nap, right? So when you wake up, the caffeine's kicked in, it makes it easier to wake up refreshed. And then last but not least, in fact, this is the single most important thing that I do to maintain energy, Rachel. And if anybody wants an in-depth talk on this, I find my podcast, Eating for Energy. So Google How Elrod Eating for Energy, and you'll get a full 45-minute lesson on this. I'll give you, you know, a shopping list on that, et cetera. It's my diet. I eat a raw food vegan diet throughout the entire day, and then only after my work day is done, my wife is welcome to prepare a healthy meal, but it might be, you know, some wild salmon, it could be some grass-fed beef, I mean, so I'm not opposed to eating, I'll eat anything, but throughout the day, I'm very strategic, and I only eat living foods 
for the purpose of having maximum energy、uh, throughout the day. Great, very cool. I'm so glad I asked that. Thank you. And another thing I'm curious about is, you know, I know people listening to you. Here you are talking about Dave Ramsey's interviewing you, Nell Darren, Success Magazine. You've been all over the place. All these reviews. And I know it's really easy to put people on a pedestal. And actually, for you, I think it's really deserved. But <laughs> I'm also just curious, like, what is something that you're working through right now, and that's kind of a struggle? And how are you getting through it? First, let me just say that a great question. But I'll just say this on the on the thing of people putting people on a pedestal. My wife, I mean, you know, she loves me. She thinks I'm amazing. But she also she'll come to one of my speeches or events and. People are like, "You're married to Hal? Oh my gosh! Like, what's he like?" And she'll see people come up to me and be like, "Oh Hal, I, you know, you're this, you're that. I love your book, or I love your podcast." And we'll we'll leave, and she'll go, "It's so weird that people think you're like this, like amazing, you know, like, <laughs> you're just Hal, you know." Because she sees my, you know, my just my dorkiness and my faults or whatever. But I think you know, in terms of what I'm working through, I'm always working through fears. I'm always working through insecurity, and I work. Strategically and intentionally to to overcome them through affirmations, right? I any fears that I have, I'll write an affirmation that kind of reflects not the fear but the truth about what's possible, not what I'm afraid of, but what's possible if things go according to plan or what you know I fulfill my potential, etc. But a great example is this live event. Um, the fear, you know, they say fear disappears in, in the face of action, right? That's an adage that's been around for all of time, and it's so true. I have had a fear of putting on my first live event forever, and the fear is filling the room. And intellectually, it doesn't make sense. I've got, you know, I've got six thousand people in the Miracle Morning Facebook community that are, you know, raving fans of the Miracle Morning and that listen to my podcast. You know, forty thousand podcast downloads a month. Like, I know that all these people, you know, listen to my stuff, read the book, etc. This should make anybody feel good. By the way, that has a fear that it doesn't even make sense, but you have it. Like, know that successful people have it. My fear of I don't know how I've never gotten people in a room. I've never gotten a hundred people to come to an event. The, the event itself, I, I have no problem talking. Like I, I'm a speaker, I can go speak, no problem. That part I know how to do. I have no fear of speaking for two days. I have a fear of getting hundreds of people to sign up for my event. And I think that probably comes. I tried launching a coaching program once. It was only twenty-five dollars a month. It was like really inexpensive. And I thought a thousand people would sign up, no problem. And I think like thirty people signed up. It was like utter failure, right? And so I think that's where some of that comes into play. But I was like, you know what? I it's not about me. I owe this. I have a responsibility to share what I know with people. And people have been asking me, are you ever going to do a live event? I I need to do it, right? I need to do it. And then I was like, you know what? I want a hundred people, but let's just say I only get twelve. Those twelve people, I'm going to give them the best. We'll change their life, and I'll get better and get a hundred next year. So I finally just did it. And You know, it's just amazing. But once I started planning it, and I started reaching out to hotels, and I, you know, book, I booked the venue. And it's like just the fear went away. The more action I took, the more the fear was minimized. And then I put a page where people could put their email in and say, "Hey, I, I'm interested. Let me know when the registrations open." And it was crazy. I put it up. All I did was announce it in the Miracle Morning community on Facebook. And by the way, for anybody listening. I invite you, and Rachel, you can probably speak to this, but the Miracle Morning community on Facebook has become the most like inspired, supportive, motivating, energized group of the coolest online communities that I have ever seen. And you have to ask to join it, but I will approve you if you want to join it. And just come and check it out, and you can, you know, be a fly on the wall or, or ask for support or, or whatever. I just put in the Miracle Morning community. I didn't even announce it to my email list yet. I just announced it to the community. Hey. Guys, I'm finally doing it. I'm finally gonna overcome this, you know, this fear I have, and put on the live event. You can put your name and email in, and bestyeareverblueprints.com. That's the place where people can just. You know, the registration's not open, but it's we're working on that site. But okay, if you're interested, that's what they can do. So they went to bestyeareverblueprint.com, and within like 48 hours, 299 people had gone there and said, "Yes, I want to know more about the event. I want to, you know, whatever you're afraid of. If you're listening right now, whatever you're afraid of." Put an hour in your schedule by the end of this week to take the first step toward whatever it is, whatever you've been putting off, whatever goal or dream you have that you're afraid of. Schedule an hour right now. Do it right now. An hour, ideally in the next 24 hours, but by the end of this week or by the end of the weekend, dedicate an hour to taking your first step or your next step toward what it is. 
that, that you're afraid of, but that deep down you know you want it. And deep down you know you, you're capable and you know you deserve it. And you know that other people deserve for you to get over your fear and just do whatever it is. So put that time in your schedule and make it happen. Oh, perfect. I, I can't think of a better way to end <laughs> than that. So let's just leave it on that super high note. And where can people go to learn more about you? Hal Elrod, H-A-L-E-L-R-O-D.com. If you want to look into my you know, speaking or coaching or, you know, or send me a, a message. If you want to get the Miracle Morning book, go to Amazon. By all means, please go to Amazon. You can check it out there. And then uh, last but not least, if you're interested in, in just getting on the list to know about the best year ever blueprint event, you know, I think we'll have the website finished in probably the next couple weeks. And, you know, we'll send out an email letting you know when, you know, when the registration's open and you can check out the details. Go to bestyearevblueprint.com. And I can tell you now we do have the dates and the location. It is going to be December 5th through 7th in San Diego, California right next to the airport, and I was really picky on the venue. It, it had to have free parking, it had to have a free airport shuttle, it had to have free Wi-Fi, it had to be nice and new, you know, so we've got a really cool venue picked out for everybody. Oh, that sounds amazing. I know I'm going to Barcelona sometime in December, but if I'm not, I want to be there. <laughs> I would love for you to be there, Rachel. I just, I want to give you a big hug, so you have to come just for that. <laughs> like, that sounds great. Well, thank you so, so much for being here. This has been really phenomenal. Rachel, I love you. Thank you for having me. And everybody listening, thank you so much for your time. I hope you got some value. And, uh, and go out there and schedule that hour. Take your first step. Make it happen. Thank you so much for listening to A Better Life. You can find all show notes for this episode at rachelrofay.com. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe so you can automatically get access to all new shows. Let's also connect. Just go onto Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram slash Rachel Rofay, and we can talk there. The opinions of all guests here are their own, and I'm not necessarily endorsing any of them. I do want to give you perspective, though. And always remember, 